It goes to show that premise alone can't carry an experience, because on paper, Hack and Slash is one hell of an interesting game. Here's the pitch. Hack and Slash is a bird's eye view adventure game exactly like a 2D Legend of Zelda, with the ingenious hook that the world around you can be manipulated by hacking the game, which lets the player change variables and solve puzzles by altering the world to suit their very needs. It's brilliant. On paper. When you start fiddling around with settings, and the game behaves exactly like you want or expect it to, things feel like magic. Jerry-rigging a turtle to be your own personal bodyguard, or using your own creativity to make yourself indestructible, is really satisfying. In an abstract way, just playing with Hack and Slash is its own reward. Unfortunately, the game Hack and Slash is underwhelming. For me, there's an inescapable comparison between Hack and Slash and the first Scribblenauts. Scribblenauts was an incredibly ambitious DS game that had you solving puzzles by typing almost any noun you could think of into a text box that would warp the object onto the screen. The first game had a lot of problems. One of those was that solving a puzzle by riding a flying hippopotamus is really exciting the first time you do it, and uninteresting by the end of the game. Hack and Slash has a similar issue. Its open-ended mechanics aren't especially interesting to use when so many of the game's puzzles have A to B solutions. Both of these are games that have tremendously creative engines, but don't actually let the player be that creative. It's the kind of video game paradox that the Stanley Parable teases. If there's a solution by design, experimenting is more or less irrelevant. This is an incredibly cynical point of view, and I hate seeing it exposed so blatantly. And I kinda blame Hack and Slash's design. In The Legend of Zelda, you're given a wide array of tools to interact with. There are people to talk to, a whole world of possibilities. There's doubt. There's the chance that you might not have what you need to solve a puzzle, even if it's more than likely that you do. As a linear game, the original portal has momentum, switches, and the companion cube working as different input methods to keep you guessing. Hack and Slash has all sorts of different tools for puzzle solving, for example a hat that reveals invisible platforms or enemy vision cones, but these don't add to the game's core mechanics, they more or less replace it. You're scarcely using your array of abilities in tandem to solve puzzles. Mostly, you're just using different skills one after another. I'm not sure if this is because the game's premise is too vast to be packed into a 5-hour experience, or if Double Fine just isn't confident in the game's core mechanics to be fun for any length of time, but it does make the whole thing feel scattershot. In some instances, the game will wow you with a clever use of its premise, and then the next moment it'll pretend that concealing UI elements only to reveal them later is puzzle solving. All this is to say nothing of the game's fourth act when it very suddenly asks you to have a basic understanding of how coding works, however mundane it may be, with zero explanation for those who don't. Yes, this moment is as jarring as it sounds. It isn't to say that the story isn't cute, or that the game isn't visually appealing. It's both of those things. In fact, the characters made me smile on more than one occasion. It just isn't a fleshed out experience. There's no progression, no adventure. Through its presentation, you're meant to believe there's a whole world out there, but you're never given a chance to explore it. Early on, you're given an item that lets you see each of the zones you've passed through in a complete flowchart. Just like the rest of the game, that's a really interesting concept, but it highlights just how surprisingly restrictive the game is for its players. <laughs>